9 reads, however, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. Then in Revelation chapter 5, then I looked... And heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne, and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. We have a worship song that we uh, pretty much sang into the ground a decade or two ago called uh, I Can Only Imagine, which uh, thanks to uh, Tim Hawkins, the kind of Christian comedian, he does like Weird Al takes on worship songs and he changed that one to from I can only imagine to I can only eat margarine, and that's all I ever think of when I hear that song now. But the actual words, lyrics, say things like, I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes would see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Then the song goes on to suggest that just about anything might happen, and uh, even Baptists happily sing about dancing. So obviously it's a traumatic experience uh, to be able to see that. But all that to say that our passage is continuing um, in this overall theme through Hebrews of of that there's something better, the superiority of Jesus beyond imagination, but it was also beyond anything that the first readers of this letter had ever experienced. So so there there were no good reasons to turn back away from this new covenant relationship with God. Um, to a past that was, yes, maybe more tangible, more familiar. There were things they could touch and see and feel and think of all of the tradition that they were being asked to move on from. But that doesn't mean that the new was not more real. Uh, There was no good reason to turn back. Uh, But before I even proceed and, uh, you know, read all of Hebrews chapter 8, And this talk of the old covenant and the new, and now the old is done away with in favor of the new. Because we're 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 at Remembrance Day in less than a week. And uh, you know, I should remind you, as the book of Hebrews has all these contrasts between the old and the new, between Old Testament Israel and the New Testament church, that we read from a passage called Hebrews. And it goes on and on expressing the superiority of the teachings of Christ over Judaism, i.e. the Hebrew faith. And we can too easily forget that some pretty horrible things were done in order to eliminate the people who refused to leave the Old Covenant behind. Uh, I was reminded in something I read just this week, and I never really thought of it this way, that pretty much every official from the top down to the lowest private down to just employees of the horrible machinery that caused the Holocaust, probably 80% of those people or more were baptized as infants. If they were married, they were probably married in a Christian wedding ceremony in a Christian church led by their pastor. So you can go in pretty dark directions here if you're not thinking about what we're talking about when we're talking about the superiority of the old from the new. And the, well, we'll get back to that. But I just wanted to bring that up and and bring it uh, and mention it. There's a lot of anti-Semitism that happens as a result of people being too triumphalistic about, well, well, we've got the new, we've got the better. So I just wanted to bring that up. Let's... Read all of Hebrews chapter 8, and uh, it's a long passage, but uh, we're going to read it together. You can tell it's a change in the uh, flow of the letter because it starts out, now the main point of what we are saying is this, 
Seven chapters have taken to get here. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. I'm going to stop there. Next week we're going to pick up more on this new temple, but we're going to just focus on chapter 8. Again, he started with this idea, you know, here's the main point of what I've been saying. He's basically saying we're not talking about a hypothetical high priest here. We have this kind of high priest. Um, There's something where when something is true spiritually or supernaturally, we tend to discount it in favor of the real, the tangible, the material, something you can touch. And uh, this passage of anything blows that out of the water. Jesus maybe isn't in this temple that they could touch and see and feel and they could speak to, directly to. He's more real than what they're being tempted to turn back to. They're being tempted to turn away from the more real to the mere copy, the mere pattern. He says, we do have such a high priest. He says, who sat down? This high priest sat down in the presence of God, in the most holy place, in the temple in heaven that this temple on earth is only a copy of. Now you can go back, we're going to get back to how important it was for Moses to, to build this tabernacle exactly according to God's instructions, follow it right down to the letter and why that matters, but there's a lot. You want to try and hammer through or read the Old Testament in a year, you're going to go through the, uh, the books of the law and the time where Moses is given the law and all the instructions of, of what kind of material to make this part of the temple and here's the furniture and you can go through all the details. And you know what you won't find? You won't find a description of the uh, high priest's couch, his chair, his hammock, his recliner. Because when they were on the job in the temple, they were never sitting down. They never came out of the tabernacle after a day of barbecuing and said, it's finished. The work's done. But this high priest did. After his work was done on the cross, he said, it is finished. So he sits down in the very presence of God. Think about that. Look where Jesus is sitting down. At the right hand of the throne of the majesty 
in heaven. Once in a while, uh, if, you attend, if you attend large sporting events once in a while, if you're like me, you're usually wishing you brought your binoculars because you're up in the cheap seats that you can afford. And then every once in a while, there's a little contest, right, where somebody from up in the nosebleeds wins courtside seats. You know, and they get to go down and be right down there with, near, with the, in the $500 seats and, and up and, and be able to watch it right up close. You know, they get a free upgrade of their seating. My older sister was flying in for six weeks to uh, kind of come back to Barrie, take care of my mom for a while, and her daughter gave her a tip. She said, Mom, get some of those expensive, cho- nice bag of the nice chocolates from Costco, and when you get on the plane, hand it to the steward or stewardess and say, hey, there's just a little gift. I understand COVID's been really hard on you guys, and I just want to bring some appreciation. As soon as she did that, the stewardess said, oh, thank you. And what seat number are you in again? And then as soon as they took off, my sister moved up to first class. Okay? So it's worth trying. There is no seating upgrade for Jesus. He can't be at a better place. He can't be closer to the core of all power and glory and majesty. There's no promotion. There's no promotion. There's no, there's no better seat. There's no upgrade. Not only is there no upgrade in all of reality, he, he can't, he, there's no upgrade in all of reality, not just the world, not just the universe, not just creation, but all reality, natural and supernatural. Now take a look at verse 2, though. Despite that kind of exaltation, look at verse 2. And who serves? Who serves in a holy temple? How, um, how opposite is that to the typical side effect of earthly leaders who get exalted in this lifetime? The service part tends to get a little challenged. Um, the foot washing story of Jesus in the upper room, he wasn't just acting. It was consistent behavior with who he is. He serves, look at the sanctuary. He serves in a sanctuary. This, we're going to talk more about this next week. He serves in a sanctuary set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being, not made with human hands. I want to talk about that in case I, I forget to come back to it next week. Not made with human hands. Human hands can make some amazing stuff. <laughs> human hands can make some incredibly beautiful stuff. I, I, it's part of a, how we reflect being created in the image of God. Uh, we should visit more art galleries. We should sign up for more tours of cathedrals. You know, I just looked up as I was thinking about this. I wonder how it's going with Notre Dame Cathedral in France after the big uh, fire. And for sure, there's a giant website. And you can donate money to just about anything. And you just see that incredibly beautiful structure and what they're going to spend on it. And some people in the world think, oh, well, that's terrible to spend all that money on such a thing. But it's like, it's a beautiful piece. It's pretty awe-inspiring. This comparison isn't saying oh, anything made with human hands is terrible. No. This is superior. Like, there, think about it. Think about the most beautiful, glorious piece of art or anything you've seen made by human hands. This is something greater. Um, The location is greater because of comparison. I was going to say that Jesus' temple is incomparable. Then I realized that's exactly what this whole chapter is doing. He's helping us to be able to imagine. That chorus I kind of made fun of at the beginning. I can only imagine. So God's Word helps us imagine what's beyond our imagination by these comparisons. Verse 3 to 6 is kind of reviewing this idea. We talked about it last week that, that Jesus really wasn't from the tribe of Levi. And there were priests serving on earth. But in an earthly temple that is a symbol of a greater reality. And Jesus serves in that greater reality. His ministry, like I said, is more real. It's not less real. And, and that's really good for people to think about. There are, there are uh, translation issues and, and uh, some kind of doctrinal pathways where where one, pa- one pathway, this is definitely comes up in the uh, end, different end times scenarios. 
that people hold to. And, and one of them particularly gets criticized for interpreting five or six verses spiritually. Oh, well, that's not as solid because you don't, you don't interpret that literally. And I always want to say, well, how is something spiritual less real than something material or literal? Because here, there's that temptation here. Jesus is in that spiritual temple. It's more real. It's not less. Um, remember, I said uh, we need to not think that you have to denigrate the importance of the revelation of God through ancient Israel. Look at verse 5. Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So to say that this first system or this first temple or this first priesthood was a pattern of what it was to come doesn't mean that there's nothing great or amazing or significant or important or foundational about that pattern. I like to think of all of that, the Old Testament theology that's packed into, like if you wanted to do a study of the different pieces of furniture in the tabernacle or all the things the priests had to go through to get ready, I think of it as like this theological zip file. You know, Remember when RAM was so expensive and, and, and computer storage was so expensive, they had to create this program to shrink things down into a tiny little small file. But then when you could transfer that in an email and boom, when you open it, there was so much in that tiny little file. Well, that's our Old Testament stories and the tabernacle. What's incredible about them is how much revelation God packed into a little tiny package. You think of all of the significance of the most holy place in the temple, it's probably smaller than this room we're in right now. Okay? And yet, what is it it a pattern of? The right hand of the throne of the God of all majesty. So, so don't think that, that uh, we have to denigrate what was before. Um, that's why God was so adamant that Moses would follow the details down to the letter. I, I thought of that this week. God calls us to do some things. And sometimes they don't make sense to us, and we think it's just a small deal. It's like, well, it's, how much does that really matter? Well, it might matter exponentially more than you ever imagine if it's something that God instructs you to do. Sometimes it's not all about you. The temple, tabernacle, obviously wasn't all about the tabernacle. It was what God intended to do in the world through the things that the tabernacle revealed. God seems to have revealed a visual model to Moses. It was something of massive significance in redemption history because of the something greater that it projected toward. Well, Jesus is that something. I don't know if... Science fairs are still a thing. I know in the 1960s and 70s they were huge. Like there's movies made like the Rocket Boys, I think it was called, uh, or something like that, of, you know, when there were like national science fairs that you could get to and win scholarships and all that. Well, imagine if a, if a senior high school student that was incredibly bright, incredibly great with his visuals and his uh, modeling skills and his engineering mind, if he made a little tiny scale model of the Darlington nuclear facility and won. If he won, it would be because, man, this guy nailed it. Like everything's in this little model and he understands how it all works. And let's hope it's not a working model. <laughs> that would be a little dangerous in the gym. But, but, you know, he's made this model and it represents something massive, something great. That's the Old Testament system. Uh, it's... The new covenant is greater because of where he is. Sometimes when I haven't heard from people in a long time, I will say, hey, uh, you know, online I'll say, hey, how you doing and where are you doing it? (laughs) You know, like I've lost track of them and I don't know where they are now or where they're living or what they're doing. And, and, And this passage, this superiority of the new covenant is based not only on what Jesus is doing, but where he's doing it. So, so. After all that, we're faced with with the where. We find that it's also superior in substance. The what is superior. Because it's established, our passage said, on better promises and is administered in a better place. And and we heard that the Old Covenant, verses 6 to 8, was was limited. We could say flawed. Uh, But again, I, I don't want when you hear limited and flawed to project onto it corrupt or somehow morally deficient or, or broken, 
or uh, a bad design flaw or something like that. It was limited in that it, for its intended purposes, it had a short time shelf life. It, for, remember that for a time, the intended purposes, for its intended purposes, the whole temple and sacrificial system was God's plan for the world. If there were flaws in the Old Covenant, it was on the human side. It was on the human side. The superiority of the new one in verses 8 to 12, if you'll take a look in your Bibles, is that this one has what we would call a superior inwardness. That's where my graphics of a new heart is talked about here. That Old Covenant was written externally on, on stone. This one would be written on human hearts. We, we talked at, way back in chapter 4 about that famous passage, I keep bringing it up in men's group even, about God's Word being living and active, sharper than two-edged sword, able to divide between soul and spirit. And I said, that's a pretty precise slice. To be able to cut between soul and spirit, I don't even know what the differences are. How would you even see the difference between soul and spirit? And it can divide. Um, and and it, the thing was, it, it made us pretty motivated for the fact that we need a better priest. Because that passage went on to say, everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So now you compare that, and where do you find yourself in verse 10 of this passage? I will be their God, and they will be my people. I listened to a podcast while I was driving on Friday, and the author that was being interviewed was telling a horrific story of losing his two-year-old daughter to just, uh, I, I don't know how to tell the whole story, but it was just a completely random accident. And it, boom, she was killed. And uh, he went on to say that in this story, as he was talking about, he's talking about the language that he uses to talk about his daughter and all of these things. And he says, he said, and this really struck me, he said, there's no world that exists where I am not her father. So he doesn't use language like I was her father because he's still breathing. He is her father. Like in that short two-year period, that's who he became. That's part of his identity. So, so my my deceased father. He was my dad for, you know, 55 years, however long I had him. I still am his son. I'm still breathing. There's nothing that can change that. So now extrapolate all of that, like that, that relational side of things. Because God says, I will be their God and they will be my people. Think about it scientifically, which is always thin ice for me. Every atom in the universe, or every little subparticle, or whatever smaller little piece of material reality that scientists keep being able to discover, they're all owned by God. He made them all. God, God owns everything. So, you know, we have that joke what do you get for the guy who has everything? Well, here's in verse 10 I will be their God, and they will be my people. There's something for more, for way more profoundly relational and intimate here in, in this incredible line of Scripture from God of how He sees His children. You know, when somebody holds on to something and says, this is mine, that's the eternal God of heaven. That's the new covenant. He is ours. We are His it's permanent, eternal. He'll never pass away. He'll never die. It's for all eternity. This new covenant is grounded in Judaism. Verse 10, it's internalized. It's about internalized faith, not just the external practice of it. God's laws still exist but are now written on our hearts. That's, that's picturing this profound, transformational, intrinsic motivation for authentic Christian living. Verses 10 and 11, it is, after all, about a relationship with God, not merely appeasing Him or serving Him. And then finally, we read that it's forgiveness of sin, forms, that the forgiveness of sin forms the basis of this relationship. Here's a quote from one of my commentaries. Any conception of Christianity that neglects the idea of sin and forgiveness 
has departed from the understanding of covenant expressed in Hebrews 8 via Jeremiah the prophet. So that jumped out at me because I just hammered through all of the book of Jeremiah over the last couple of months, and that's a tough read. Uh, I counted the number of words in the line, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. That's a quote from Jeremiah. It's 13 words long. In a book that's 33,002 words long, and for the most part in that book, there are sins being remembered over and over and over. So that's pretty good news. That hidden in, the, in a 52-chapter disaster epic, epic, there's this line. Their sins, I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. So when we talk about having a relationship with God, it's a relationship established by the forgiveness of sins, lived out by the internalization of God's laws, and it relies heavily on our understanding of how God worked out this story through His children Israel long before we were ever born. And in order to have an accurate understanding of it, that's why our Old Testaments are so important and why we keep trying to read them and why we do things like hammer through the longest book of the Bible, Jeremiah, and try to make sense of it and try to see what God was speaking of and how it's fulfilled in Christ. So what? I'm going to land the plane here now. Number one, so Christianity is not about a rejection of the Jewish people. If you look at verse 10 and other places in our passage, he's talking about a new covenant made with who? The people of Israel. The salvation part of it for you and I is how we could be considered part of God's people. How we're made part of these promises. The Apostle Paul kind of words it in 2 Corinthians that all God's promises are yes in Him, meaning Christ. All those promises to Israel were fulfilled in Jesus. He's the personification of God's hope and plan for Israel. That's how we get in. That's how we're in. This is the new covenant for God's people. Um, So we continue to pray for the salvation of people who have not realized that Jesus is the Messiah that they're mistakenly still waiting for. So, so we love on them by sharing our faith with them, not, not by some kind of anti-Semitic rejection of them. Um, choosing God, choosing to reveal himself to Israel, was ultimately to reveal himself through Israel, and Jesus became the final revelation of that plan. That's where our hope comes from. Secondly, the new covenant doesn't mean that Christianity doesn't have anything to do with external practices. There was all that talk about, you know, the old. They were in an actual temple and actual animals were being killed. And now that's all fulfilled spiritually. Sometimes we make the mistake of thinking, well, you know, it's all about, like, beliefs now and thoughts and believing the right things and what we do and and the material world doesn't matter anymore. That's that's totally not right. Um, Things like our morality, our kindness, our compassion, our participation in the corporate worship of the people of God. It's very hands-on. Touch, taste, and smell. It all, it all matters. I had a conversation yesterday morning with my youngest who, who was speaking of her generation and the scores of peers who uh, she kind of is thinking about it. She's a fairly philosophical young woman, and she said, you know, Dad, I think sometimes they've uh, pretty much just kind of, um, I don't find out where I wrote down her quote here, pretty much did what they were all warned of, what we were all warned of back in Hebrews 6 and 7, but they grew up hearing over and over again cliches like, well, just being in a church doesn't make you a Christian, and being a Christian isn't about church attendance, and she says, you know, eventually they just end up with this Napoleon Dynamite kind of faith where, well, I just follow my heart, just follow your heart, that's what I do, and it has nothing to do with the hands-on um, corporal connection with the community of faith because it's just me and my thoughts and feelings and behaviors and things like that don't matter. We'll see in later in chapters of Hebrews that they're probably going to end up being in the new year as time comes on and and Advent comes upon us where he's, he's already, he spends like 10 chapters explaining the superiority of the new covenant and Christ's superior priesthood and the once for all sacrifice but he's going to continue to call Christians brothers and sisters, to be 
be sexually pure, to abstain from and resist greed in all its forms, to be encouraged to perform good deeds with which God is well pleased. Chapter 13 is where you're going to find that. If I could explain in the simplest terms, it's not that the difference between the old and the new covenant isn't uh, over the have to, it's over the want to. (laughs) The big change is in the want to. Closely related to such things, my last point is the idea that that God has forgiven and remembers no more. Um, That That's not the basis for another two mistaken ideas. One, that Christians no longer sin and that we're ever going to be completely free from it in this time. Or that it provides us with some kind of a hall pass excuse for sin. Hall pass being a modern slang for what Christian teachers used to call a license to sin. You know, license to sin is is the root of of another kind of outdated word called licentiousness. Um, which sounds like something you treat with antiseptic wipes. But, but in a few short chapters, we're given some pretty clear warnings. We've already been described as people enjoying all the amazing upgrades of the new covenant. With an, we've talked about an anchor for our souls that reaches to the most holy place at God's right hand. Yet we're still going to be told in the Hebrews to throw aside, throw off the sin that so easily entangles us. There are still things for us to throw off. We're warned not to be flippant about sin because such an attitude is a magnet for God's righteous judgment. And the fact that the new covenant talked about people knowing from the, remember verse 11, the people are going to know him from the least to the greatest. We're not going to need teachers. I'm not going to have to say, Jan, you need to know God more because we're going to know him. We, we won't have to challenge one another. We're going we're to have grown in knowledge, but that's not yet. So we're still called to continue to dig down and, and think hard and, and seek to form our lives around what God has revealed to us in every way. Um, we're told to be removed beyond the elementary teachings we looked at a couple of weeks ago and to be taken forward to maturity. And one of the many marks of maturity was to become mature enough to teach others. One last question I want to ask you is how often have you thought about your relationship with God as a covenant? As a covenant. A covenant relationship with God. I, I, the beauty of baptism as we preach it, I think, it, one of the great beauties of it, is how uh, easily um, we can use it and compare it to another part of our common culture where we understand the idea of a covenant. And that is a marriage ceremony. Because there was a spring day in 1986 where I stood before witnesses with Janine and we entered into a covenant. Vows were taken. Promises were made. Documents were signed in the presence of witnesses and in keeping with the laws of Ontario. There was a long period before that day in 1986 when we were dating for four and a half years, I think. We were pretty serious. People considered us a couple. And it's common in our day and age to say, well, what difference really does a piece of paper make? Well, in baptism, you stand before witnesses and you proclaim, I'm all in. I'm all in. You acknowledge the reality that if you understand what you're doing, that you have that relationship with God is through a covenant made by God. The requirements are all met by Him. So we won't ask you to sign a document on that day. You're acknowledging that He has already signed the document and written it on your heart, that inward reality. And you're saying, this is who I am before witnesses. It's a covenant. It's a covenant. Go and reread the covenant passages. You can use any kind of uh, online search and say, what are the key Old Testament passages and New Testament passages regarding God's covenant. Look them up and you're going to hear God saying things like this from the very beginning using words like I establish. He's referring to himself. I will confirm. I am making. I have made. God does all the work. We all have need of forgiveness and cleansing. We have stains we can't get out. 
we, we think we're pretty good at covering them up, but God has them covered. Mercy is what you turn to when you realize you have no excuse. Forgiveness is what you need when you can't make a case for yourself. Remember that two-edged sword? We're guilty with cause. Our passage told us that in the old covenant, God turned away from those rebellious people. In the new covenant, He turned toward us and called us His own. So are we okay? Are we good? I, I once asked a young hotel clerk that at the check-in. English was his second language, and he hilariously misunderstood what I was talking about. But if we were to ask that question to God, are we good? If you were to get the answer, yes, why would that be? Of someone with the two-edged sword, Nothing is hidden from his eyes. Well, I think there's a good answer for that. I think you can know that you're good through receiving the gift that is Jesus Christ. And if you'd like to know, if you'd like to talk about that, you can call me anytime. I'd love to talk to you about it. Are we good? Hebrews 8 tells us why. We can know we're good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your perfect solution to my perfect problem. Your perfect covenant for imperfect people. That the keeping of this covenant was done by your Son. That the sacrifice was finished that it's not temporary, that it's not dependent on his lifespan because he's eternal. He sits at your right hand. And we can know that we're right with you because of our superior priest. We ask this in Jesus' name.